Hello, this is going to be a four part lecture um, with each part being just just under or above 10 minutes. We want to discuss <clears throat> how to solve x prime equals ax when the matrix A is a defective matrix. Remember what defective means. Defective means that you don't have a full set of linearly independent eigenvectors. The first video that we're going to do is going to be one where we talk about the derivation of the method. And then the other three videos will be examples of different situations that you could find yourself in needing one, needing two, or um, having a multiplicity um, of two and needing one, having a multiplicity of three and needing two. So we're going to go through this um, in subsequent videos. For now, let's talk about the derivation of the method. Here's an example of the derivation of one of these methods. We won't derive each one, but here's how it works. Suppose lambda has multiplicity 2, but only one eigenvector v. Okay, so now, as we saw back in um, section 7, 2, and 3, really, when you find the eigenvalue and you find the eigenvector that goes along with it, that's part of one solution. And so we take e to the lambda t and multiply it by the vector, and that, that, that's a part of the solution. That's part of the solution. It's not the, the entirety of the solution. If we had another eigenvalue and eigenvector pair, then we would have the full solution for a 2 by 2. But here we have um, a multiplicity 2, but there's only one eigenvector. So that means that this behind the scenes, there's this matrix A that is defective. We don't have a full set of linear independent eigenvectors. So we have this part, which is one part of the solution. We need another part of the solution. We're going to call that guy x1. We need x1 to be linearly independent of x0. And we're going to take the superposition principle and add these two guys together. A linear combination of x0 and x1 will be our solution. Let's talk about how we build x1. x1 will be built by the following formula. The same lambda that was from the eigenvalue. It's going to be e to the lambda t, and it's going to be times the quantity of v1 plus t v0. This v0 that's here is going to be a, a vector that, if it's not exactly v, is possible to be some multiple of v. The point is, though, that um, v0 is, a, is, is an eigenvector. And what we're really in search of is this guy v1. Okay, we need V1 to be linearly independent of V. Not V0. We don't need V0 to be linearly independent of V. Now, what, what is so good about this V? How do we find this V1 and V0? And, and next slide, we'll see, well, why does it work? Um, the V1 and the V0 that makes up X1, they have to follow the, they have to solve the following set of equations. We need a minus lambda i quantity squared times v1 to be equal to zero. This is reminiscent of when we had um, the need to find a generalized eigenvector. This is going to be pretty much it. v1 is going to be a generalized eigenvector. So we have a minus lambda i quantity squared times v1 equals zero. We've got to make sure that v1 is not an eigenvector. So a minus lambda i quantity times v1 is not zero. If, if that was zero, then v1 would be an eigenvector and it wouldn't be linearly independent of, of V. And then finally, uh, the last condition is that um, you get the V naught by taking A minus lambda I and multiplying it by V1. So these three equations govern the solving of V0 and V1. And once you have V0 and V1, then that gives you your second solution. And it, it will be linearly independent of your first solution. And we take these two guys then and throw them into a linear combination, and then that will be our solution. You just got to make sure, though, that v1 is linearly independent of v. And so then your general solution would be x of t, who is c1 times x0 and c2 times x1. Now let's talk about where did these equations come from? I just put them on the screen. We got to understand the, the point behind them. And so the next slide is the derivation. Okay, we have x1, and we want to use that declaration of what x1 is and the fact that we're in the 
solution of x prime equals ax. We're going to put these two together on the next slide and derive where these three equations come from. So we have x1, we declare to be e to the lambda t times the quantity of v1 plus t v naught. And we're trying to solve x prime equals ax. And so if this guy is a solution, x1 is supposed to be a solution to this. So x1 prime should be equal to ax1. Okay, now let's see what that means. Now take the derivative of x1. So there are two parts to it. With respect to t, we're going to take this derivative. This right here would be the derivative of the first. And then it's times the second. So let's call it, I'll erase this in a second. The rate of the first times the second. And then we have the first. And then we have the derivative of the second. Okay, so we just did a product rule. And now we want to group it together. We're going to factor out what that, you know, every term has an e to the lambda t in it. So when we factor out that e to the lambda t, we're going to have a lambda v1. We're going to have a v naught that takes care of these two, and then we're going to have a t v naught with a lambda on it. That's the third one there. I have them in different colors because I'm going to uh, use that to help me with the derivation. Let me erase this ink here, and now we have taken care of what the left hand side looks like. Now let's deal with the right hand side, a x one. Here's x one. And now we're going to multiply it by a. And so it goes to the vector. This guy, e to lambda t, is, is considered like a, it's a function, but it's considered like a scalar function. It gets pulled out, and the a gets multiplied by the vector. So we get a v1, and, and t comes out, and we get a v0. And so looking at these two here, they're supposed to be equal to each other. I have, let me use a highlighter color here. I have, um, this is my x1 prime here the left hand side and then change the color slightly well none of these are really light that's okay and then I have uh, ax1 who's gonna be here these guys have to equal each other they both have e to lambda t factor out then we have to couple this up and see that there's parts that don't have t that's the orange and then there's parts that do have t and that is the magenta looking color. These two guys need to be equal to each other. And so we then talk about the ramifications of that. AVI, AV1, sorry, needs to be lambda V1 plus V0 and AV0 needs to be lambda V0. Let me erase the highlighters. Okay, great. So now we have these two equations. Let me, um, and now let's talk about what these two equations are saying to us. If we were to move the lambda v1 over, we would have a v1 minus lambda v1 would be equal to v0. If we were to move the lambda v0 over here, we have a v0 minus lambda v0, and it's going to be equal to zero. Um, factoring out um, the v naught, we get this equation. Factoring out the v1, we get this equation. Now, on the right here, this equation says that the v naught is an eigenvector. It might not be the exact same eigenvector that you got from that first solution called x naught being equal to e to the lambda t v. Um, but v, basically, if it's not equal to v naught, um, um, v naught, if it's not equal to v, it's going to be some constant times v. Okay. Now, back over here to the left-hand side, this is one of our equations. It says um, a minus lambda i times v1 is equal to v naught. So this is going to be basically how you go get the v naught, that equation there. And then we go and um, multiply that guy by a minus lambda i. 
And what happens then is on the left hand side, we have a minus lambda i quantity squared times v1. And on the right hand side, we have a minus lambda i times v naught. That's going to be equal to zero from above. And so we have these equations then that govern the finding of v naught and v1. We have the fact that a minus lambda i squared v1 is equal to zero. That's this guy here. Then we have the fact that a minus lambda i v1 is not zero. We don't want that to be zero. v1, we don't want that to be an eigenvector. In fact, what we want a minus lambda i v1 to be, we want it to be v naught. Let's call this uh, number two. This is the second important equation here, number two. And then this third one here is just is making sure that um, we get the linear independence. This is just making sure that v1 is uh, not an eigenvector. Um, okay, great. And so we're going to see this in the in the next exam in the next uh, in the next video. We're going to see us um, an example of this solved out. And so this this part here, v one being linearly independent of v, basically comes from the second guy here, the green. All right. So next video we'll have an example of this, and then we won't we won't derive the other methods. What we'll do is we will. Um, just do examples of the other um, the other situations that you would come in. This is where this is the situation where we have um, a two by two matrix A where lambda has multiplicity two has um, algebraic multiplicity two, but then geometric multi um, so algebraic multiplicity two. But then um, when it comes time to look at the uh, linearly independent eigenvectors, the multiplicity there is is one. And so we're a defective matrix whenever these guys aren't equal. And this is just one level of being defective. We'll look at other levels of being defective, but we won't derive it like we're doing here. Okay, great.